Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Little Wisdom and a very special one because today is the first time that we're doing a YouTube video episode. <laughs> and we have a very special guest. And just before I, you know, hand over to him, uh, I want to ask you a question. And it's basically this. Did you know that the Venn diagram of Ikigai that we see is actually not Ikigai after all? In fact, Ikigai is a completely uh, different thing on its own, uh, which is why we have a guest here today to tell us more about what it really is uh, and how the misconception of the Venn diagram that we see came about, which is something that we see on social, especially on LinkedIn, telling us that Ikigai is related to work or what uh, should fuel us or gives us purpose in our professional lives. So the guest today has had a 40-year uh, love affair with uh, Japan and anything to do with Japanese history and just Japan in general. Uh, he was five years old uh, when he first uh, went to Japan, and I think that's where everything kick-started. Uh, earlier in a conversation, I was saying that Japan is like his soul country, and uh, this is why he feels that he needs to be here today to give Ikigai, the respect and the clarity that it deserves. Uh, he also speaks very frequently and coaches on the topic of Ikigai and has spent a fair bit of time studying and researching it and also has a book on the way. Please welcome Nick Kemp, the founder of Ikigai Tribe. Thank you, Shu. It's a joy to be on the Little Wisdom podcast and we've had a few chats and you just reminded me how two years ago you probably attended one of my first webinars on Ikigai. So yeah, it's a real joy to be talking to you today. No, absolutely. And, and the pleasure is all mine. And I was, uh, you know, saying that it's, it's a full circle moment because uh, <laughs> at that point I didn't even have a podcast. So it, it's nice to be able to, to come full circle um, and uh, get the opportunity to find out more and learn more from you, not just for me, but for everybody watching and listening. We have not forgotten about the listeners. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I think let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, am I pronouncing it correct? Is Ikigai, is, is that how we say it? Or is it close enough to how it should close be? Close enough. Even I wonder if I'm saying it right, but Ikigai. Yeah. So that's that's good enough for me. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good to know. If not, we'll keep practicing. <laughs> all right. So I wanted to jump in with a question and I'm going to be uh, very careful with with how I phrase it. Um, so ikigai, of course, is a traditional Japanese concept, um, and the the misconstrued uh, idea that we have about ikigai has come in a lot from a lot of non Japanese concepts that have just kind of diluted what it really is and changed what it really means. So uh, apologies for, for calling this out, but I'm sure people watching and people listening are thinking the same thing, and I have to do this job for them, um, is what places you as uh, a white male in a position to speak more or to clarify about, you know, a traditional Japanese concept? Yeah, that's a good question. And I guess the, the short answer is uh, nothing does as, as a white male. You've, you've actually reminded me of a, a comment I saw, I think it was on Amazon, and it was, I think it was an e-book on Ikigai written by, a, again, a non-Japanese author. And one of the comments was, oh, here we go, another white guy writing about you know, a foreign concept or a Japanese concept. Yeah. So I've I've definitely been aware of of that. And so to to answer your question, I guess it's really about my connection with Japan. I've I've lived there. For ten, I had lived there for ten years, and we'll, we'll probably go back. Well, definitely we'll go back. Obviously, the pandemic's stopped me and my family going back. My my wife's Japanese, and yeah, you know, I went there. As a five-year-old, fell in love. I have some memories of that first trip. I think the the babysitter made me and my brother origami. So I have this beautiful memory of that. For me, there's this desire to present a more respectful and authentic, uh, or 
sort of careful, I, I don't like to say the true version of Ikigai, but something that's respectful and authentic to Japan. And it did start, interestingly, I, I have a vivid memory of when I was first introduced to the word in 1998, when I returned to Japan to teach English and a coworker sort of casually asked me, oh, Nick, what's your Ikigai? And I'm like, Ikigai, mm. well, what's that? And her explanation was just so inspiring. And I thought, wow, you have one word that encapsulates these ideas of life purpose and, you know, the reason why we battle on through life. And so I was kind of, I was actually hooked, but you know, 20 plus years later, I stumble upon the, this Venn diagram. And I think this is very unusual. Like Japanese would never articulate or define a word like this. And I, initially kind of just shrugged it off and thought oh, I must be a Western interpretation. But like you, I, I kept seeing it everywhere. And it got to a point where this inner voice was saying, you know, you've, you've got to do something about this. And so that's where my journey began of actually researching it started. And that was about four years ago. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it does sound to me like you have received a lot from Japan and all that it has to offer. Um, and you almost feel like there's a sense of responsibility to, to return that in, in whichever way you can. So I completely understand that. And I think a lot of people out there will appreciate this. All right. So you have written that Ikigai is not about money. Uh, it's not about what the world needs from you. It's also not what you're good at. And it's also not what you love. So <laughs> what is Ikigai? I think the best way to think about Ikigai is it's, yeah, it's not a sweet spot to achieve. It's actually something you feel. So it's, it's very much tied into your emotions. And we'll, we'll get into, uh, I think I, I've, I've mentioned to you this amazing woman, Kamiya Mirko, who wrote this seminal book, Ikigai Needs Suite, which would just translate to regarding Ikigai or about Ikigai. In her book, she states the most genuine thing or the most honest thing about Ikigai are our feelings. And she has a definition, a two-part definition for Ikigai. So when she refers to Ikigai in her book, she's talking about a source or an object, and that could be a person, a relationship, a hobby, uh, nature, even, even memories can be an Ikigai source. And then she uses the word Ikigai Khan to represent your Ikigai feelings. I like to use her example and I, I would think of my son. So he's my Ikigai source and I have these feelings of love, you know, connection, pride in the young man he's becoming. You know, there's this playfulness to our relationship and I have hope for his future and an array of uh, feelings or emotions are tied to him. And it's these feelings that make my life worth living. So Ikigai is something that makes you feel life is worth living. And the scroll behind me here, that is the character for Khan. It's a, a beautiful nice. character. And the bottom radical is actually heart, um, Kokoro, which oh. ties in both your your mind, your heart, and your spirit in the context of uh, Japanese, the way Japanese define kokoro. So that's probably the, the biggest thing we're missing. It's something we feel, but then it's, it's tied into ideas of, I guess, intrinsic motivation. So it's things you do because you, you enjoy doing them or they simply hold value for you. So if you love singing and you sing badly but you love singing that could be an ikigai source for you and then on a deeper level one way to, to think about it is existential positive psychology where we mm -hmm. our life's challenges and even to some degree suffering if we can bounce back and flourish and we learn things about ourselves we never thought existed we have this deeper understanding of who we are and we think, oh, my life is worth living. And I feel that my life is worth living. And then one more angle to contrast the, the Western perception, instead of a sweet spot, 
uh, another author, a current day author, Ken Moggy, who is a neuroscientist and a prolific author in both Japanese and English, he defines Ikigai as a rich spectrum of all the things that make your life worth living, from your morning cup of coffee to pursuing a life-defining goal. And I think that's a really good way to look at it. It's this rich spectrum that we can be grateful for. So our friendships, even what we're doing now for me as an Ikigai source, connecting with someone, having this sort of intellectual intimacy, you know, I love it. It makes my life feel great, but it can be, yeah, you know, a morning walk or connecting with nature or a hug or, um, you know, ringing up an old friend, all these things. It doesn't have to be one flamboyant, grand, big goal that you're striving to achieve. I'd say, remember, it's something you feel and you can have a spectrum of Ikigai sources. Wow. That is definitely <laughs> different. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I think it's important that uh, people listen and when people want to listen or you know learn, they, they will. Um, first of all, I think it is a definitely very something uh, that's a stark contrast to what we have been seen, what we have, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've been taught, because it goes way beyond uh, just the professional aspect of what you're good at, you know, what you enjoy doing, and then you make money from that. So it's absolutely yeah. nothing to do with that, you know, and what you spoke about, uh, you don't have to be good at it. It just makes you yeah. happy because uh, I'm terrible at dancing. Like nobody should ever... <laughs> <laughs> nobody should ever see that uh, you know it, it would uh, I don't know I think people would come out of their grave if they ever saw but it makes me really happy you know so that is my ikigai because I feel really happy after that but um, nice. it, it's it sounds to me like I mean if I can be audacious enough to even try to compile it into just a bunch of words that are not in the same language of origin it, it sounds to me that it's something that simply delights your soul in, in one way or another. You know, uh, you don't have to be good at it. It doesn't have to have some kind of a, a financial or economic benefit. Mm. It's just, does it make your soul kind of expand in its consciousness? Does it make your soul delighted or happy? Yeah. And I think the secret is to um, perceive that as in a little way, in, it, in small ways, it's, mm. But yeah, I mean, if we define as it sort of connecting to your soul, giving you some joy, it, it is these things that you, yeah, you enjoy doing, you love doing, and perhaps they excite you or they give you comfort or um, they, they make you feel grounded and connected to mm. who you think you are, to yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think one of the things that are really life, uh, like, about this, or rather, I should say, I love about this was um, Kami Meko, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the, it's what well, you said, the mother of Ikigai, you know, there's some woman power there. And it's not like she just randomly came up. She was, she studied this. She, she was a psychologist or was she a psychiatrist or? Um... She was a rock star is the best way to describe <laughs> her. So she, yeah, so she, she had a, an amazing life. She was the daughter of a diplomat. She actually spent most of her early late teenage years yeah early late childhood early teenage years in Geneva and she wow. learned to speak French and so she became a linguist and she then learned English she went to America to study classical Greek just unbelievable then she switched to medicine she became a psychiatrist she became a linguist a translator, an interpreter. She actually translated Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Wow. You, you wouldn't believe this, this so many uh, accomplishments. Um, sh and the foundation of her work was actually a study of Japanese lepers. So there's okay. this amazing story about her, uh, sort of behind her book. She definitely campaigned for lepers in Japan to be treated better because they were ostracized they were shipped off to islands treated really badly yeah cut from their families but she found that some lepers with sort of severe disabilities no fingers being blind mm. could find a, a reason to live and they could for example 
they might listen to the sounds of nature mm. and orally compose haiku, haiku poetry. Yes. Or some would learn the harmonica and they were blind and they would read Braille with their lips and tongue to the point where they would bleed because it was so meaningful for them. And I think they even sort of had a, a musical group that ended up touring Japan and other parts of the world. And she found, yeah, despite incredible disabilities, some would want to live. And yet she found others who had mild conditions. Still, I still had leprosy, but relatively mild, had no desire to live. And she mm. began to question why. And that led to her writing her book. But she, I mean, she was, uh, yeah, you know, she was a mother, a female in Japan in the, I guess we're talking really post-war Japan where she started to study medicine. So yeah. the odds were stacked against her to achieve everything she's achieved. And she became this pioneering uh, researcher and the very long journey, she had to get her dissertation to give her the, the freedom to write. She was supporting her husband's work, who was also a researcher. She was bringing up two children. She had her own health issues. So there's an amazing story behind her and her research. And it's kind of tragic that no one knows about it. And yeah. we see it as this Venn diagram. So that's also part of what I'm saying. It's like, hey, you know, I think I mentioned to you when we think of psychology or philosophy or positive psychology, it's all fathers, you know, all fathers of psychology. And she's years ahead of the positive psychology movement of the sort of the, the 2000s. And no one knows about it. So yeah. she definitely deserves recognition. For sure. I had no idea <laughs> that. Uh, I mean, even when, when I was thinking, okay, the mother of uh, Ikigai, you know, I, I thought it was just that, but she's just so much more than just yeah. that, you know, I can't Im imagine her experiences and, you know, it, it's very moving to hear about, uh, you know, the people she came across and the desire to want to live and to experience whatever they can with what is possible for them. I think that's one yeah. of the most beautiful, it's painful, but it's also just a, a testament to the human spirit. Um, so it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm <laughs> definitely right. going to, you know, go go here and, and learn more about her because I had not heard of her prior to this. So uh, definitely for everyone watching and listening, go go find out more about her because it, it deserves to be known. Um, yeah, there's actually, I'll just let you and your audience yes. know, there's a book called A Woman with Demons, and that's her biography. And it's wow. in English. And okay. all her work is only has only been published in Japanese. So none of her books, unfortunately, have been published in any other language but Japanese. But there is this amazing um, biography of her life and you, yeah, you sort of begin to understand. She had her own tr troubles with uh, life and yeah. questioned whether it was worth living and it's a fascinating story, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, I think we'll put the link to the book where we can, wherever you are watching this, we'll, we'll add a link in the descriptions. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's it's through pain that people find joy, you know, or yes. sometimes through realizing pain that you realize other people's and you appreciate happiness when it when it comes in. Yeah. Uh, as Rumi said, I think um, I love Rumi. He's one of my favorite poets. He had said uh, um, uh, some, you know, Oh gosh, I I don't want to rephrase what he said. I mean, obviously he was he, he wrote in Persian, so I don't know how accurate the translations are. But I think the concept was that when something is broken, when something is cracked, that is actually how the light gets in. Uh, you know, yes. so something does need to break in order for the light to come in. So uh, that is part of life, I guess. All right, uh, coming back to <laughs> Ikigai, but this has been a beautiful conversation. Absolutely, I, I love this. Um, I hope people might be, they might be thinking we're, we're rambling, but uh, it's important for everybody to hear the holistic view of what yeah. Ikigai is and the people behind it, the men and the women behind it, specifically mm. women. Uh, all right, so <laughs> I want to go go into, come into the, the, the present a little bit more from, from the past 
And so we have a good idea of what Ikigai is now and also what it's not. Um, you know, something that makes you happy in little ways. It's not about work or money. It can be across and you don't necessarily have to be good at it. Uh, and we know the Venn diagram is not definitely what it is. It's it's not an accurate representation. So how did this misconception come about of the Venn diagram? How did that start? Sure. So I think we need to begin with saying that that Venn diagram it is inspiring, it is helpful, it's, it can be used as a coaching tool, and there's a reason why people share it. And so credit goes to a man called Andres Zuzunaga, who's a Spanish astrologer and author, and I had the pleasure of interviewing him, and he's a very gentle, kind soul, and for him it was this expression of purpose. So in the center originally was purpose, was in Spanish, so proposito. And so he shared that on his Facebook page more than, more than 10 years ago. And I think it got picked up a little bit and shared around, and eventually it was translated into English. Mm. And so if you Google, you know, the purpose Venn diagram, you'll, you'll see it as the purpose Venn diagram with purpose in the center. Then one day, <laughs> and this, this man's really funny and, and fun, and he has such a unique perspective on life, and he describes himself as many things, as you know, he's owned by a dog and he's a father and a husband, but he's also a, a mischief maker and lover of changing the world in this very, very playful way. And he one day watched... Mark Wynn, who I also interviewed, he watched the TED talk on, I think it's titled How, How to Be, How to Live to Be a Hundred Plus by Dan okay. Butner. Yeah. And it's touches on those five blue zones. And he briefly mentions Ikigai and mentions Ikigai very briefly, saying, and they have this word Ikigai that imbues their lifestyle and you know the reason why you get up in the morning. And he offered a few examples of centenarians living with Ikigai. And so this sort of created the perception that, oh, Ikigai is something that's related to longevity, which really isn't. So Japanese don't relate longevity to Ikigai. But yeah, Mark was watching this and he kind of thought, ah, oh, wouldn't it be a cool idea <laughs> to merge the two concepts? And so he simply replaced purpose with Ikigai, mm. wrote a blog, and it was almost like an afterthought. Just he thought, oh, I'll, I'll share this with my community. And that was it. So he did it in a sort of innocent, playful way. And it was nothing more than that for him. And he, he talks about how it was really nothing more than 40 minutes of his time. And nice. then it, it didn't go viral straight away. I think it sat on his blog for six months or a year. But then someone picked it up. And then it went viral. So it was this innocent, playful idea to merge two concepts. And he later wrote a, a follow-up blog post saying, hey, you know, all yeah. I did was change one word on a Venn diagram and I just related Ikigai to purpose. It was nothing more than that. And now it's, you know, it's changed some people's lives. And so for me personally, I have this almost this debt of gratitude to Mark, to, to both Mark and Andreas, because without Mark doing what he did, I, I wouldn't be talking to you today. There's absolutely no way we'd be having this conversation. Right. So I wouldn't want people to think I'm speaking badly of the Venn diagram or that I you know, wouldn't like Mark for it. It's positively impacted my well because I've got this opportunity to share what Ikigai means in the context of Japanese culture. Right. No, absolutely. And it sounds to me like Mark is very creative. He sees, he sounds like a creative to, to me from what I hear. So I think, you know, for him, it was uh, uh, an opportunity, of course, to create something that was inspiring, you know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, social media has just obviously accelerated so many things <laughs> in people's lives, uh, including, you know, a lot of other concepts and other fake news that we hear. I mean, the pandemic was a great example of that. Um, so sometimes things do get picked up. And I think when things get shared extensively, sometimes uh, 
people don't have full context as to, you know, it gets more and more diluted sometimes. So, so uh, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like, you know, Andreas had one concept in mind and, you know, it was important what he was trying to explain. And Mark, I think, just wanted to create something else that would add to that inspiration. And yeah. I think today we have something just because humans are humans, not because it's anybody's fault, uh, you know, has turned into something else altogether. So, but the good thing is it, it does continue to inspire people. Uh, whether it's purpose or whether it's ikigai, I, I think the fact that there is the translation, you know, ikigai does not equate purpose because we are also talking about two very different cultures. Um, and, and I face that sometimes in, in uh, when I'm trying to translate things between Hindi and Punjabi and English is, um, you know, sometimes you can have one word to describe so many things in one language, but you cannot really have the exact same thing in another language. So it does sound to me like that also plays a bit of a, a bit of a role. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the word for purpose in Japanese is shime. And, mm. and it's something Kamiya writes about because it is, it's an aspect of Ikigai. But yeah, it's not, it's not the whole, it's, it's not translatable. You can't say Ikigai's purpose. And then it, it goes back to actually in her book, a sense of purpose. So mm. shime kan, right. and we use that word again khan so it's it's about your feeling or your sense of purpose and it, it is fascinating though how as ikigai it did go viral rather than purpose and right I've, I've often thought about why is that is it ikigai as this element of mystique and intrigue and 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 beauty is it because a lot of people perceive Japanese culture as oh, this amazing, all this history, all this wisdom, and people don't question it. And I mean, I even have people sort of arguing with me that, oh, you know, that is Ikigai now, it's evolved somehow. And, you know, they have no concept of Japanese culture. And they say, you know, because it's popular, it, it takes on a new meaning. And why do you have a problem with it? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of attitude and sometimes uh, this is a bit funny but my, my son calls it I'm the ikigai police and then I'll be <laughs> on LinkedIn politely correcting people or sharing with people that you know that the framework's actually um, some, someone else's work we should be thanking Andreas and um, some people are very receptive to it and kind of thank me and say oh thanks for sharing I didn't know and other people aren't so it's interesting how yeah some people will be receptive and open and others are like oh i'm not interested in the origin it's, right. it's evolved or so it's yeah that's interesting yeah and i think it's also uh, maybe a, a reflection of how badly the world needs purpose at this point i think we have turned purpose into you know, this elusive thing that if you have it, you're like healed and uh, everyone must find their purpose. You know, I think we've kind of gone into a bit of a too sensitive about what is my purpose with mm -hmm. at every stage that we begin to question, I think, more than we just live and flow with life. So I think it's a bit of a testament to the purpose pandemic, if I can call it that. Uh, that I think everyone's going through. And I, I just want to add to that, that it's it's uh, it's a difficult thing what you're trying to do, you know, uh, because like, uh, you know, I mentioned in one of the things, being Indian, yoga is something that is taken so out of context in so many ways. And people think yoga is the postures, but that is just one arm. And those are actually called you know, asanas and things like beer yoga, hot yoga it's not nothing to do with what those asanas and what yoga is really meant to be and and sometimes when i you know express my disinterest or uh, dissatisfaction at my own culture being sold back to me in a completely misconstrued way um it is met with a fair bit of you know resistance because i think people hold very dearly what gives them their purpose yeah. So it's it's a um, it's a push and pull, but uh, that's life. But I wanted to go into you know a little bit more about this because you mentioned about you know not everybody is receptive, and you've spoken to 
you know, and interacted with a lot of researchers and a lot of them are Japanese. Uh, do you have an idea on how they generally feel about Ikigai being misconstrued? I do. So some, because I, I ask them, some say it's just strange. They're shocked or confused. One, I mean, one young man recently on, on my podcast talked about how he he's born in Japan, spent his first 20 years in Japan, then moved to the States. And he has his own story with all of that. But he remembers a couple of years ago going, or a year ago going to, I think it was actually a Zoom, must have been a Zoom during the pandemic. So it was a Zoom event within his workplace and someone was presenting Ikigai as the framework within his company, a coworker. And he obviously he thought, well, I'll just watch it. And he spent quite a long time mulling over whether or not he should tell the coworker it's wrong. Mm. And in typical Japanese fashion, he kind of thought I better not because I might be perceived as mansplaining. Mm. So I thought, wow, here you are, you are Japanese, but you're worried about being you know, perceived negatively if you go and culturally explain something to someone. Um, one researcher kind of found it, you know, a little bit amusing as in, oh, you know, well, there is this tendency in the West for, for people to define things and try and articulate it rather than be comfortable with uh, ambiguity or vagueness um mm. and then i've had other people say it's painful it's painful to mm. see ikigai associated to a venn diagram and it hurts their soul their heart and to yeah. relate ikigai to money and that you have to be good at it and so yeah that's a sample of some of the reactions i've, I've seen yeah right no, it's it's understandable, I think, to to get that kind of reaction. And yes, I think if Ikigai was something that you were not supposed to be good at, I would be very sad if I had to dance. <laughs> like I mentioned, you know, I'm a horrible dancer, but I love dancing. And, you know, it gives me a sense of joy in being so. And it's understandable, I think, when it's when it's something that uh, is so closely related to a part of your identi identity as being Japanese and it's misconstrued. Uh, I think all those reactions are, are you know, except, uh, expected. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk, uh, actually give something to our, our listeners. So if our listeners are looking to practice or integrate Ikigai or just to be more uh, aware about what it is in their day-to-day, -day, how can they start? You know, what can they do? Yeah, so I thought about this and it's it really is going back to things that uh, – intrinsically motivating so i'd say to you keep dancing or um, <laughs> i will <laughs> sing or, or play but i think one thing is i think if you guys deeply connected to our relationships so if you haven't spoken to a good friend for a while surprise them call them up or let you know let someone close to you know how much they mean to you and how much you love them and how much you, you need them in your life. Um, being told that you're you're needed, you don't have to say I need you. You can just say it in a way that's comfortable to you. But letting someone know that they mean something to you is almost a gift of ikigai to them. But it makes you feel good too, you know. So connecting ikigai to a relationship is really important. So celebrate your friendships, help others, and for you personally, it's. Yeah, it's, it's doing these things you like, dancing, singing, playing guitar. Another thing you can do is start something new. So start that hobby you've always put off. Don't worry about whether you're going to be good or bad at it. Just start it. And perhaps one thing I recommend everyone do is connect with nature. Go out in nature yes. for a walk. And I was reading recently, I was doing some research how Let's say 
I mean, for both religious and non-religious, but a spiritual experience for the non-religious is often found in nature because we can experience yes. or we can we can see something in nature that's yeah, awe inspiring. We see a bird take flight or we see flowers we've never seen before. So that's something you can do. And that makes you realize you are part of bigger something. Uh, yeah, you're part of something bigger than yourself. And it's, so I learned this term that the small self, like if we can mm. feel the small self, it's quite powerful because we realize, wow, there's this whole world around me and I've been so distracted. I didn't notice. Yeah. No, absolutely. I second the the bit about nature. Every time I feel overwhelmed, it's, it's the one place to go and it, it almost, it has a spirit of its own. It feels alive. You know, if you yeah. just sit there and it, it really grounds you in, in so many ways. So Nick, as you know, this is a science and spirituality podcast, which is why we're having this conversation to begin with. Um, I wanted to ask you, is there anything that you do every day or on a regular basis that it's rooted in science or spirituality or particularly maybe in, you know, aspects of Japanese spirituality that, you know, you can share with our listeners? Sure. And I've, I really do try to make a practice of two things is to be intimate so I'll I'll try and steal a hug from my son or I'll kiss my wife or I'll just have a you know perhaps a meaningful conversation with someone so I try to do that every day and also I think it's really important to express your creative self even if it's only for a, a few minutes so that I'll often get my guitar out and I will use the memo feature on my phone and I'll somehow I'll just end up creating a little tune and then I'll record it and I've got hundreds of little tunes on my iPhone to explore or to just listen to and think wow when did I write that little tune you kind of feel different after the experience of creating something you have this sense of satisfaction and it's like this little growth growths happened or you've connected to you know, I don't know your true self or your creative self and it's it can only it doesn't yeah it can just, it can be just for you that five minutes and mm. I think it grounds you it connects you and then you move on with your day just feeling more alive or feeling better so that's yeah. what I'd recommend yeah intimacy and creative expression, even if you only do it for a few minutes. Absolutely. And intimacy can also be emotional intimacy and like you said, intellectual intimacy as well, like through conversations where you feel present and connected to, to somebody or to the moment. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another mistake. You you say intimacy and people tend to think it's, oh, it's only physical, but it's Mm. experiential, creative intimacy, intellectual, emotional, um, even spirit, yeah, spiritual intimacy. Spiritual, that's yeah. right. So, right. Um, definitely explore all those areas. For sure. Wow, this has been a wonderful conversation. <laughs> one last question before I let you go. Um, so actually two. Uh, one is where can people find you if they oh. want to find out more about you? And also, could you share a little bit more about your upcoming book? Sure. So people can find me at ikigaitribe.com and the, the best place probably would be to go to the podcast page and start listening to some podcasts if you're wanting to learn more. And then the book is a work in progress. It's, it's been a, a journey and I can reveal the title. So the title will be Ikigai Khan. So mm. it is this emphasis on that ikigai is something we feel and it, it sort of touches on the research of Kami Miko. I really am bringing together everything I've learned and sort of trying to put it in a, a format that's, I guess, is accessible or, or makes sense. And hopefully it adds some value to to the readers <laughs> if anyone reads it. So yeah. They will, they will. <laughs> I hope they do. Yeah. So. so, and I think it's also a bit of a testament to the responsibility that you feel to having, uh, you know, 
uh, having to share more about Ikigai and what it really is. And I strongly believe that when a story wants to be told, it will find someone to tell it. So you don't have to be good at it. Like you just said, that is what Ikigai is. You don't have to be good at it. It just has to bring you some element of, I'd like to believe, spiritual expansion or spiritual duty. Um, And the story will tell itself. I I strongly feel that. So all the very best for this book. I will read it. So you definitely have one reader there. (laughs) Don't need to worry about that. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for being with us and sharing. I want to thank you for having me on. And I, I, I love I love your Little Wisdom podcast. I love how you articulate concepts and your authenticity. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to look back on this conversation as uh, Ikigai Source. So, and I'm glad we've, we've, I guess we've got a friendship now. So I'm really grateful yes. for that as well. So. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. It was uh, my pleasure through and through. (laughs) So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. That was Nicholas or Nick Kemp from Ikigai Tribe. And just remember that Ikigai is not your purpose for being in a professional setting. It's not something you necessarily make money from. It's just things that bring you uh, a sense of connectedness and intimacy to your soul and to your spirit. You don't have to be good at them. So if you want to dance and play the guitar and you're not good at it, it's okay. Because then, you know, that's just like me. (laughs) But do (laughs) things that make you happy. Tell people uh, they matter to you. Steal a few hugs and kisses from the people that matter to you. Help others. And start that new hobby that you've been putting off just because you think you're not good at it. Because it's not about being good. It's about being happy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Nick, again, once again. Thank you for being here and for being the first guest for this YouTube um, episode. (laughs) And uh, yes, remember, if you want to connect with Nick, please go to ikigaitribe.com and uh, do check out his upcoming book when it's out, Ikigai Khan. Till then, take care and stay wise. Bye, everybody.